Okay, week three lecture is mostly going to be videos. There's a couple of things I do want to go over, things you need to make sure that you do before you perform any special procedures. So let's talk about the setup and technique um, and some of the common things that you have to consider. Such as the first thing you want to do is make sure that you check all lab tests. Um, you need to check um, the charts for the patient's PTT and PT. Um, PTT stands for partial thromboplastin time, which evaluates um, the effects of heparin, aspirin, and any type of antihistamines that your patient might be taking. And what we're looking for is how it affects the rate that blood clots. So the PTT, the normal level, before you can perform any kind of procedure, should be within the 60 to 70 second range, okay? If that's the, the one that you're actually focusing on. Other places will just get like a prothrombin time. Um, <clears throat> this one's better at regulating and seeing um, patients that are on some kind of anticoagulant, such as Coumadin. So we'll often look at the PT time, which that value is between 10 and 13 seconds. Again, this is how long it takes for the blood to clot. And a more standardized one that pretty much across the board, most people are going to look at this one because this is a little bit more accurate, um, is the INR, International Normalized Ratio. And this one is, is better because there are some fluctuations from different labs like Quest or um, LabCorp. They may actually have different values for PT and PTT. So because the way they process it different labs, it is better to probably just look at the INR. Um, and the normal INR value should be less than 1.4. So again, the INR is most important, especially when you're considering the fact that they may have gone to different labs for PT and PTT. Now, why do we have to look at these? Well, it's important to know if you're going to do any type of biopsy procedure, we want to make sure that your patient isn't going to bleed out. So um, we gotta, we've got to ask them a couple of questions, especially things like, is there anything they could be taking, like antihistamines? And they may not even realize that, but that can thin their blood. Now, most doctors are going to order this regardless of what the patient says. So um, hopefully that isn't an issue. But you still want to ask them some questions if they're on any type of blood thinners, things like that. <clears throat> And as always, it's important that you get uh, the right patient for the procedure. So you always want to verify that you are scanning the correct patient. Sometimes your patients can't communicate with you. So they should have bracelets. They should have name tags. There should be something that identifies the patient, especially if they can't communicate. Maybe they had a stroke and they can't speak. But um, again, that's extremely important uh, for obvious reasons. Verify correct location and side, because sometimes we have to mark the spot and we have to um, label which extremity we're looking at or which side we're biopsying or whatever the case may be. Um, and you're not going to be the only one to do this because in the past there have been mistakes made where you know, we thought it was the right leg and it turned out to be the left leg. We certainly don't want to do things like that. That could be, um, you've probably heard this before in surgeries where they've taken off the good leg and, and nobody was paying attention. So now there's a process that the hospitals go through and pretty much they call it a timeout. Everybody just sort of goes through a whole checkoff sheet and make sure that we're doing the right patient, the right procedure, the right extremity or left extremity or whichever one we're we're looking at or um, if it's the thyroid or whatever procedure we're doing, multiple people have to um, go through that timeout procedure and check off everything and make sure that we're, we're double checking and triple checking. Um, if you're going to do any kind of invasive procedure like this, uh, you must get signed consent, um, <clears throat> get the PT, PTTs and INR ready for the um, radiologists because they're going to want to know that. So verify all bleeding times are in the normal range. 
Um, again, double check, check and make sure that the patient isn't taking any blood thinners or certain medications that will act like blood thinners. And of course, you want to make sure all your equipment and supplies are ready for the procedure. <clears throat> During and after the procedure. It is your job to reassure and try to encourage the patient uh, to relax. They, they, you know, they're nervous. They need someone to make them feel comfortable. So not only are you a sonographer who performs, you know, exams, you also have to consider patient care. That is part of your job and making them feel comfortable and not anxious and nervous. Uh, of course, you're going to have to assist the physician. That could be difficult at times. Every physician is different. They all have uh, different personalities, as do all of us. So. Um, you want to accommodate the physician that you're working with. Properly bandage the patient afterwards. If they need a Band-Aid, maybe they're going to need some kind of dressing. Most of the time, if it's a larger cut, the, the radiologist will do that. Um, and then, of course, we're going to, before they leave, if they're outpatients, we're going to give them an instruction sheet of how to take care of, of um, let's say we're doing a prostate biopsy. Uh, what I would tell them is, you know, it's normal to have a little bit of, of rectal bleeding. You're not supposed to have a lot of bleeding. Only when you wipe. If you're bleeding too much, give us a call. Make sure you look for, and it'll go through a whole list of signs and things that they should look for after any procedure that they've had done. And then, of course, the time frame for results. I would usually say to them, it takes about two to three days for you to get the results. That's the average time frame. It might be a little bit longer. It might be a little less, but your doctor will notify you with the results. Um, sometimes you have to take the sample down to the lab, and if not, you get to arrange for somebody to come pick up the sample and deliver it to the lab. And then, of course, you got to properly dispose of fluids, uh, needles, anything that you might have used during the procedure in the proper um, locations. There is a sharps container for sharps, such as needles, uh, certain fluids. Again, you're going to go by the guidelines at the hospital that you work at. And when you go out on clinicals, of course, someone's going to show you all this stuff, or at least you're going to get to observe this. Sterile procedure. Well, the best way to learn sterile procedure is to actually do it and mess it up. Because once you mess it up, you're never going to forget to do that again. You're going to be very careful the next time. So basically, again, the next uh, um, part of this is really a lot of videos that's going to show you how to do this. It's kind of hard for me to explain uh, without a sterile tray in front of me and show you how that works. So you're going to watch a bunch of these videos. This is some of the equipment you're going to probably be using. Um, if you notice here, some of the transducers come with biopsy guides that slip right onto it, and then the needle goes right into this location here. Um, most of the time, you're going to need some sterile gel, some probe covers, um, draping. <clears throat> this is showing you different um, plastic uh, attachments for the, the needle for different transducers. We talked about the importance of how to go in with a biopsy. Now, it's not your job. I realize that. But you'd be surprised at how many um, radiologists try to come in straight down parallel to your transducer. And the problem with that is if they come straight down, you're not going to be able to see the needle. So what they want to be is 90 degrees with the needle from the beam. So let me draw that for you. If this is the beam coming out of the transducer, you want the needle to be as 90 degrees as possible so we get a reflection. What we don't want is if this is your beam coming down, we don't want the, the radiologist to place the needle parallel because you won't be able to see it. Okay? Paracentesis. This is the removal of ascites. We may be doing this for diagnostic purposes or therapeutic or a combination of both. 
Uh, therapeutic is usually when we know what's going on with our patient. Maybe they have liver failure and that's what the cause is. So we're just trying to make it easier for them to breathe and, and all the stuff that went along with poor retention, uh, maybe a cause for their ascites. So other reasons we might go in and just sample the fluid because we don't know what's going on with our patient and we want to get a diagnosis. So um, the ascites can be sent to the lab for both reasons. Um, it is our job to mark the site and typically include the depth. And what we're trying to do is find a location where there's more fluid and less bowel. The last thing we want to do is perforate bowel. So I like to do the biopsies with the radiologist live. Some places will just put an X there and say, hey, go 10 centimeters in, and you'll be in the biggest pocket of fluid. I'm not really comfortable with that. You know, organs will kind of, or bowel rather, will kind of float around in that fluid. Um, so I prefer to do them live. And um, hopefully, you know, they'll give you that preference. And we only remove fluid in the amount approved by the radiologist. Um, and of course, if we remove too much fluid, we start bringing that, that bowel closer and closer to the, the needle and the chances of perforating increase as well. So we typically remove a certain amount. Um, and of course, as, as it sounds like common sense, but use care when handling the containers because a lot of times they're glass containers and the last thing you want to do is, is drop that. So here in this picture, there's obviously a lot of fluid. We don't see any bowels showing up in this particular picture. So this is a nice pocket of fluid for the radiologist to go in and aspirate. Um, so this sonographer is basically measuring the depth of the skin and then showing how far in would be the best location to be in the center of that fluid. And again, every place is different. We always pretty much did ours live. This is what a sterile tray would look like. Here's a biopsy needle. These are some of the containers that we would fill with the ascites. And again, a lot of times they're glass, so you want to be careful with that. And basically, we are removing ascites as the removal of the fluid below the diaphragm. Um, like I said, there'll be a video for all of these procedures. Thoracentesis is very similar to a paracentesis, except for a thoracentesis is above the diaphragm and around the lungs. This is the removal of fluid in the pleural space. Uh, when there's too much fluid in the pleural space, we call that a pleural effusion. This also may be done for diagnostic or therapeutic um, or both, basically, purposes. Um, mark the site between the rib space uh, as inferior to the lungs as possible. Typically, you're going to have your patient um, leaning forward but sitting up. The reason for that is it allows the fluid to fall and gather in the dependent portion, making it a larger portion to, um, to aspirate without accidentally puncturing the lungs. So we want a big pocket of fluid. So sitting them up, we're putting that entire pocket in the dependent portion instead of a small amount of fluid all the way around the lungs which is the way it would be if they were lying down. So this gives us a nice pocket of fluid to aspirate. Um, as always, be sure that you close the tubing when switching bottles so you don't have fluid going all over the floor or yourself. Um, you also don't want to introduce air into the pleural cavity, and that can cause a pneumothorax. And again, when you watch the videos, that will probably help with some of the understanding. And we typically don't remove more than 15 milliliters unless instructed to do so. I guess it really depends on how much fluid and, and why we're doing it. And another thing about um, a, a thoracentesis is we typically only do one side at a time, even if they have a bilateral thoracentesis. And the reason for that is if we do accidentally when removing the fluid, what happens is, and maybe I can try to draw this. Um, let's see if I can find a nice slide to show you. More drains. Okay. 
what happens is if you have your needle, okay, and this is your needle in here, and you're starting to withdraw some of that fluid, what's going to happen is this fluid is situated between the visceral pleura and the parietal. Okay, the visceral and the parietal layers. So as the fluid is being removed, what's happening is the visceral and the parietal layers are getting closer and closer together as there's less fluid in there. And what we don't want to do is have this needle puncture that visceral layer of the um, pleura because what can happen is if all the fluid comes out, now we have a nice little hole right here and it's small it's, it's just a needle puncture but it doesn't matter if there's a needle puncture here because we remove too much fluid air can start to seep out in this space and now what we have is air filling this cavity and we have the same problem happening but this time it's called a pneumothorax so what we would have to do then is um, put a little chest tube in there to drain the air out until this little wounded area heals itself, which doesn't take typically very long, but that's what we want to avoid. Hopefully that was easy to understand. Um, this is just showing you basically ultrasounds uh, roll, how we usually put the needle in below the rib, okay? Or above, I guess it's hard to say on here because they're right in the middle, which is probably the best thing. You want to be right in the middle. You don't want to be too close to the vascular bundle there of, of nerves and vessels. And again, the patient sitting up allows all the fluid to pool in a dependent area like this, making it easier to aspirate. Here's sort of a live picture showing you what a pleural effusion would look like and see how we use the diaphragm as a landmark. So this is, whoops, black isn't showing up good. Right, this would be considered above the diaphragm and a pleural effusion. If it was the fluid was all around the liver here, that would be a site. Aspiration. Okay, this is used for pretty much assist uh, analysis um, or we can aspirate by using fine needle aspiration of a small solid structure that's uh, we did we talked about this in small parts but the fine needle aspiration is when you pretty much scrape a bunch of little cells and then you suction them kind of out and look at them under a microscope so we use um, aspiration for cystic structures and usually for solid thyroid masses We'll use um, FNA. <clears throat> and sometimes we're removing the fluid just because it's for thera therapeutic reasons, because the cysts are so uncomfortable and painful that we need to remove them that way. But a lot of times cysts will come back unless you dry out that capsule. So sometimes they have to use like an ethanol, kind of like an alcohol to dry out the capsule so they don't keep reoccurring. Some more needles. Baker's cyst would be a cyst behind the knee. Thyroid biopsy, FNA, we were just talking about that. Fine needle aspiration. Again, they use a small needle. They'd rather do this than use um, a biopsy needle, a large core biopsy needle, a core biopsy, because it's so vascular and it's so scary when you're so close to like the jugular and the carotids so we have to be really careful unless it's a really large nodule it would be a lot better and more accurate to do a core biopsy but because of this delicate vascular area we start with the fine needle aspiration and hope that we're getting enough of the sample to make a diagnosis breast often that's pretty easy to do a, a aspiration or a core biopsy that would be a core biopsy in a breast and what are we doing we're, with a core biopsy? We're basically retrieving um, a sample of that tissue for analysis. So core sampling is a larger sample 
and we get more intact cells for analysis. So this is always going to be better than the FNA. And ultrasound guidance is usually um, assisting core biopsies of the breast, thyroid, um, liver. Those are the more common ones. Um, deeper biopsies may not be done with ultrasound. So you want to uh, look at some of the thyroid biopsy. I think there's an attachment. Um, it doesn't show up on here, but if you click on it, there might be an attachment that just gives you a little rundown of um, some of the things that we do with a thyroid biopsy. Breast core biopsy, again, similar needles, biopsy kits. Some radiologists prefer to use biopsy kits. Others think it's a waste, and they'd rather just use a few of the contents, and you just have to get the, whatever it is that they're requesting for the biopsy. So this is what a core specimen would look like. And here they're showing you like the size of it. It's kind of like a, a little small worm. So you get a piece like this is the biopsy right here. I don't know if you can see it. I'm outlining it. That would be the sliver of tissue that they would remove with a core. And of course, it's always best when the needle is perpendicular to the imaging plane. So if our ultrasound beams are coming in this way, this is exactly the way we want to send in our needle, 90 degrees, giving us the best visualization of the needle actually going in to the abnormality. We want to be able to take pictures showing the needle is actually in there so it's very accurate that way. A couple of more samples of needles. Breast needle localization. A lot of times they do these with um, mammography as well. Ultrasound isn't the only modality that does imaging and um, biopsying of the breast. <clears throat> Um, sometimes what they'll do is, and usually this is done in mammography, they'll put a little tiny marker in the skin, like a little pellet in there where the abnormality is, and this is what they're showing you in this picture. Um, I think in the next one you can see an ultrasound picture. They put in this little catheter tube and leave a little marker in there so we know the area of the palpable abnormality, and then they can do a mammogram, and we can look and see if it's in the actual spot that they're feeling. And then there's a video on needle localization. There's also more videos on liver biopsy. A little handout about how we typically perform a liver biopsy. These, I, I've assisted on several of these and I have to say that these seem to be the most uncomfortable um, for the patient to tolerate because I think when they give them some lidocaine it may numb the surface, but going in there deeper, the liver is very vascular too. They tend to, to bleed a lot with these procedures. Um, the radiologist tends to be a bit more aggressive because they have to push really deep in through that, um, down to that tissue through the ribs and the cartilage. So this, this tends to be a bit more uncomfortable. So I try to comfort my patients as much as possible because they might get a little agitated or uncomfortable because it, it, the procedure itself is. And then, of course, we do core biopsies so we can get enough of it. Yeah, they're kind of bloody, leave a lot of bruising. The liver is highly vascular, so this is expected. Um, here, they're showing you the needle going right through the lesion. We want to make sure, however, it doesn't go and, and sample too much of the normal tissue outside. We want to kind of have the end of it right in here and then get a nice core slab right through there. So again, it's kind of your job to say, hey, the needle's in there or, or they're far enough in there and, and make sure that uh, we don't go through it, past it or anything like that. And actually, I think this one will send you to another link, of just a handout. Prostate biopsy handout. 
I think Ms. Pfeiffer did these sauna histograms with you, I'm sure, in OBGYN and one and two. This is when they put a sterile um, saline into the uterine cavity through this balloon tipped catheter. And they sort of, by putting all this fluid in here, sometimes when, when a woman presents with a thickened endometrium, we can't tell whether it's polyps, cancer, or just a simply thickened endometrium. So when they put this um, fluid in there, it pretty much helps to separate the two linings and you can easily differentiate polyps from fibroids, um, from thickened endometrium. So it's, it's really beneficial in visualizing the endometrial lining and diagnosing the difference between those different conditions. Um, and we usually do this with real-time imaging. Again, more trays. They're all kind of similar. Um, these are just showing you how a balloon tip catheter would look when they in inflate the balloon. Starting to fill that cavity up with fluid. So once they put that catheter in, it's a lot easier to visualize. You could see a mass versus a polyp. Uh, different things can be pointed out there. CVS sampling. Um, that sampling of the um, you've got the amnion, the chorion uh, layers in the fetus as well um, in OBGYN. So this is one of the things we, we look for some abnormalities. I, I'm pretty sure they have a lot better tests now. They don't do as much of these things as they used to. But this is a biopsy of the placenta um, and the chorion, and it tests for genetic abnormalities. They usually perform these between 9 and 12 weeks. Um, and as most procedures, they get the results in about two to three days. And anytime you, you biopsy or do something that increases the risk of miscarriage, but it's, it's a very low rate. And we don't do them unless we absolutely feel it's necessary. Does the benefit outweigh the risk? And we would do this with ultrasound guidance as well. <clears throat> and again, this is showing a little bit more how that's and here you can see the needle in there. Amniocentesis, that is basically the sampling of the amniotic fluid. Um, I hope this stuff is updated. Miss Piper's stuff, I would go by hers when studying for the registry, but whatever, you know, like I said, this is... Um, we go by the book for the class, but I'm sure she has the most updated stuff that's on the registry, so I would go by her notes. But usually done between 15 and 18 weeks. Um, again, we're looking for any abnormalities. Um, and also, sometimes we're just wanting to know if the lungs are developed yet so they can deliver the baby if they need to deliver the baby early. Um, also used sometimes to relieve polyhydraminose, but that's usually associated with other conditions. Usually get the results in about seven days. I'm sure it's a little faster than that. And miscarriage rate in these is about one in, I don't understand, that's a big range, 250 to 500. Again, go by whatever Ms. Piper gave you because that is her area. She updates and keeps up with the, the newest uh, information that will be on the registry. And this is how uh, this amniocentesis is, is performed. They're going to go right through the mother's skin, uh, right into the amniotic cavity there, and just aspirate some of that fluid. And it's done with ultrasound guidance. Um, when I did this, there was a couple of, you know, one place that I worked at, two doctors like these done two different ways. One would always do it with ultrasound guidance live, and the other one wanted us just to mark the depth and how deep in they needed to go. Um, I, he was always very successful with them and never had any problems, but to me it seemed a little risky, especially when you have ultrasound right there and it takes two seconds to just kind of peek. But he, that's the way he used to do it. he just go in there blind. I would tell him how deep to go and where the largest part, pocket was, and I'd put a little X there. And, and again, he was very lucky. It seemed to work out well for him. 
more sterile trays. And that's about it. So basically this week, you know, look at a lot of these videos, get very familiar with the procedures. Um, hopefully those will help you better understand them and make sure you understand what your responsibility and your role in procedures is. Okay, and correlate these with the chapters. I know there's chapters in the book that correlate with special procedures. And um, of course, I want you to study the workbook pages for this week as well.